All right. So here is what we are going to cover today. Um, so we're going to talk about what caucus is and why we do it. We're going to uh, go through like caucus basics um, and do a sort of little run through of the night. Um, then we're going to talk about what comes after caucus, which is assemblies um, at the county, state and other levels. Uh, and then we will have time for closing uh, and questions at the end. Uh, as we go, um, I will pause at different moments uh, to take questions. Please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, and if you haven't found the chat yet, it's the thing that looks like a little a little cartoon bubble, like somebody's talking. Um, if you click on that, it'll open up the chat window and you can type it in there. So feel free to drop questions in there. That's the best place. But again, I will also be pausing at different moments uh, to take questions. So uh, so don't, uh, don't be shy about asking them. Um, I am going to try to keep things moving. We ran five minutes over at the first one, and I am really trying to get us out of here on time for this one. So, <laughs> all right. Um, and then, Jenna, I still have, I still see your hand is up. Uh, did you have a question or was that just in reaction to the uh, asking if folks went to caucus? I've been to caucus before. That was in reaction. I'll, I'll lower it for you. Sorry. Cool. No, no worries. Just wanted to check in and make sure you didn't have a question. All right. Cool. And then I just want to note that uh, Dementor Colorado and the Colorado Education Association um, both have also done caucus trainings before and the materials that they have uh, that they worked on very industriously provided a strong basis for this training. So thank you to both of them. Um, all right. So first things first, what is caucus? Um, caucus really is just, it's a meeting in your neighborhood. Um, and it's a meeting where you and your neighbors, your, who are Democrats, uh, come together, um, and select delegates to go to an assembly or convention. Now, this used to be, uh, connected to the presidential race. Since 2016, after 2016, it no longer is. It's connected to the top of the ballot um uh race that is not the presidential race um uh, we'll talk about, it's weird this year uh we'll talk about that in a second usually it's governor or u.s senate uh, that is the the top of the ticket um this happens for over three thousand precincts across the state um and if you're wondering what a precinct is it is the smallest little political subdivision you can be in um the census uses precincts um so do other things but basically, it is your house and a couple of blocks around it, most likely. Uh, that's a precinct. Um, and, you know, just as a sort of frame of reference, um, like a house district in Colorado could have 30, 40, 50 precincts in it, depending on the population of those precincts. So, um, so yeah, it's just like basically folks in your neighborhood in your are who's in your precinct, and then you will caucus uh, together with other precincts as well at a, at a site. Um, and only Democrats or Republicans hold a caucus. If you are unaffiliated, you cannot caucus. Uh, it is really just about the major parties um, and their internal organization. So why is caucus important? Um, and why is it important to go? It really helps progressive candidates out uh, because you can run to be a delegate. And uh, delegates are the ones who fit, who determine which candidates make the ballot for that party. Uh, and so you can decide which Democrats you want to see on the ballot, you know, in your House district, in your congressional district, etc. Um, and it also, you know, for if you're interested in supporting particular candidates, um, it gives momentum behind those candidates. If somebody comes out of the caucus and assembly process, having won a supermajority of the delegates, well, they're feeling good. And if somebody came out of the caucus and assembly process having won, you know, a small minority of the delegates, they're probably not feeling so good. So we want to give the candidates that we love that momentum coming out of caucus and assembly. And it also, you know, the other thing that happens at caucus is it shapes the future of that major party. Um, so you could run to be a precinct organizer, which is a formal role that has the power to shape the Democratic Party. 
um, because precinct organizers are members of the central committee, which can vote on resolutions and other things and rules and other things that are the official things of the Democratic Party. Um, and uh, central committee members also determine which ballot measures, uh, what ballot measure positions the party will take, etc. All right. And I'm just going to note here that we WFP has never had a Republican apply for our endorsement. Probably smart of them. Um, and so all of our experiences within the Democratic Party uh, caucus and assembly process. So we are presenting from that perspective. Um, the Colorado Republican Party does do a caucus and assembly process. And we believe that many of the procedures are similar. But, uh, you know, please go check that out if that's the caucus you are trying to go to. <laughs> um, and you see the website up here. Okay. So. Let's talk about the basics of caucus and kind of what happens. So uh, first off, it is held March 5th through the 9th. Some of them this year are virtual and some are in person. Um, basically, the count different county parties. So the Adams Dems and the Denver Dems and the, you know, Archuleta Dems, like all of them uh, are having uh, their caucuses on the same day within the county. But the counties vary. Um, and you can find a list of all of the counties and what they're doing and what date their caucus is right there, coloradodems.org slash caucus. Um, there's a couple, though, that we, uh, we've noted here because these are key counties that have contested primaries. Um, you can see that most counties are doing them on the 9th. On Saturday the 9th, most counties are doing them virtual. Um, but, you know, Arapaho, like, Adams County is doing their stuff in person. Denver is doing their stuff in person. Boulder is doing their stuff in person. Uh, and Arapaho, uh, Denver decided to do it on Thursday night in person. So, <laughs> you know, it really just depends on what county you're in. Make sure you know uh, what your county is doing. Um, in terms of who can come it is any registered Democrat uh, and it's who is affiliated with the Democratic Party at least 22 days before caucus, um, which depends on the date of your caucus this year, obviously, right? Um, and that, uh, you know, so that is between February 12th and 16th. Regardless, it is long since passed. If you are an unaffiliated, you cannot re-register tomorrow and then just go caucus. Um, yeah, you also have to you also have to be a resident of your precinct as of that date. Um, and so, you know, if you have but there's a but here, um, which is if you have moved within that time, you can still caucus. I'll get to that in a second. Um also people who are 16 or 17 years old and have pre-registered um and as a as an affiliated affiliated voter of the Democratic Party um can also vote. So if you have a teenager at home <laughs> who has pre-registered, they could also go caucus even though they're not 18 yet. Um and then an immigrant who becomes a citizen after the deadline uh can also caucus. Uh, and unaffiliated cannot caucus, but they can observe, which is to say that if you are a progressive unaffiliated and you just kind of want to see how this whole caucus thing works, you can sure go and find out. Uh, you can't vote. Uh, you shouldn't participate in discussion, but you can go and you can watch and see how things kind of go down. Um, and here's that thing. If you moved after the deadline, you should caucus at your old precinct's site. So you should look up where your old address goes. Uh, and yeah, that's what you need to know. So uh, one other note here is for folks who are going to in-person caucuses, if that's what your county is doing, if you live in Denver like me or Adams, like I think at least one other person here, um, you don't need to register in advance. You can. You don't have to. Like Denver has a free registration. You don't have to. You can still just show up in caucus. Um, virtual caucuses, though, are typically being held by Zoom, and that may require registration in advance just so that they, you know, are keeping the Zoom link secure. Now, that could be a minute before. It doesn't really matter. Um, 
But just note, if you are late to caucus in either case, in person or virtual, you may not be admitted. They do close the doors um, once the once the caucus is gaveled in. Um, and that's so they can't have a you know whole bunch of folks come in as you know and kind of disrupt what's already going on in caucus. So um, please be sure to get there on time, whether it's virtual or uh, or in person. All right. Uh, so at caucus, delegates will get elected to county assemblies. Um, you can see that those county assemblies are also, uh, you know are also coming up in March. They're happening pretty quick. Also depends on the county. And you can see the dates for those uh, at the same website uh, on the Colorado Dems. From county assembly, folks will get elected up to other assemblies. There's multi-county assemblies. So some, uh, some folks, you know, who live, some districts don't exist just in one county. There's one example here in Denver, House District 9 is mostly Denver, but there's a few little pieces of Arapahoe County in it too. <laughs> and so that can't get decided at a single county's assembly. That has to decide be decided at a separate multi-county assembly that both Arapahoe County and Denver County will send delegates to. Um, and so HD9 will always be a standalone thing. Um, and so those multi-county assemblies, they, uh, they operate, they're, they're happening end of March through through early April. There's congressional district assemblies as well. Those are on April 11th. And then there's the state assembly and convention on April 13th. So all of these things have delegates. You can be elected to any of them. Um, the congressional district assembly is just FYI. It was, it's your congressperson, but it's also the other races elected by congressional districts. So for example, the state board of education and the CU regents, if they've got folks up. So, uh, and then the top race this year, uh, you, you know how I just said it was normally governor or Senate? Yeah, well, we don't have any either of those races this year. So it's the at-large CU regent race. It's the only statewide race on the ballot. So that is what the official preference poll is going to be on at caucus this year. And if you, like I, have not spent a whole lot of time thinking about the region at large race, well, I doubt you'll be alone at caucus. So <laughs> I expect there may be a number of uncommitted delegates going through on the region race, but that's just my uh, personal guess. So, uh, so yeah, that is what the official preference poll will be on at caucus this year. And so... When you run for a delegate to county assembly or to any other level, you can run as a delegate that's affiliated with a particular region at-large candidate that you like, or you can also run as an uncommitted delegate. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then the other thing you should know is that you can, and this is important, we'll say it several times throughout this training, you can ask for a straw poll in any other race in your area that you choose, but they're not binding. Delegates are not elected based on those straw polls. So um, the only thing that matters in terms of delegate counts, whatever, uh, is region. That said, if there's like a DA race or a house district race or a whatever in your area, right, and you want to know how and you're thinking about who you want to send up to county to be a delegate, you probably want to ask them where they stand on those races. <laughs> and so you know, hey, this precinct is all about candidate X in the House District race, but this guy over here is for candidate Y. We probably shouldn't send him up as a delegate to county. We should send somebody who supports candidate X, right? So just know that you can ask for that straw poll in other races couple of things to know before you go. You want to find your caucus location. So again, here is that Colorado Dems website. <laughs> find your county there. Um, and you'll want to know your precinct number if you can. And we're actually going to do this together right now. So, oh, went too fast. Uh, what I want you all to do is to go to GoVoteColorado.com. If you don't know your precinct number, um, 
go to GoVoteColorado.com and you will uh, you will after you go there I'm pulling it up myself now so I can do, do it alongside y'all so if you go to GoVoteColorado.com or .gov both work if you scroll down, you'll see a link that says Find My Registration. You click on that. And then you enter in your info in that little form. Click the little box that says You Are Not a Robot. And click Search. All right. Was everybody able to get to the Find My Registration page? So once you get to that, uh, you will see a little screen that has your name and your birth year and your voter ID number and stuff. And then you'll go, I don't see a precinct on here. And that's because you need to click on the little tab that says county and district information. And once you do that, you will see about a million districts listed, but the top one is your precinct number. And so, uh, the generally speaking, the digits that you will need on that are your last, the last three. So in my case, my precinct is one three three zero eight one six eight zero eight. The main thing I need to know is that eight zero eight at the end. So when you have found uh, your precinct number, I want you to drop it in the chat. All right, we've got 194, we've got 104, mm -hmm. 110, a lot of ones, 92, okay. Jacqueline, what are the last three? Is it 092 in your case? Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, I have paperwork from... Uh, the Dems, because I was their precinct organizer, and that's what it says on it, is 92. So I just went off that. <laughs> Are you in Pueblo? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Pueblo might do things differently. Most counties, they need a three-digit number, but it could be a two-digit number down there. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Pueblo's could... weird. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. A little bit. All right. So we've got a 409. We've got a 720. We've got a 534. Nope, Denise, you're right. 409 would be the one. For sure. Because I know you're in four. In Denver, uh, if you're a Denverite, the first digit of your uh, of your precinct number is actually your house district number. So, yeah. Yep. So, Isabel's in 534. Yep. All right, so it seems like y'all are getting it. So write that down somewhere, have it handy. You can absolutely look it up at the caucus site. It just saves time if you can go, hey, that table over there says, you know, precinct 527, and I know that's me, so I'm going to go sit at it, you know? So, uh, and leaves the lookup computers for folks who don't know. So, okay, cool. Um, And then, you know, Again, just be sure to find where your county Democratic Party uh, is caucusing. You can go here to the to the state party website. Um, you can also just search your county name Democratic Party, and it should be the first link, and they should have caucus information up there. So, all right. Any questions about any of that before we kind of go a little bit more in depth into what's going to happen that evening? All right, cool. Let's talk about what happens on caucus night. So first off, when you arrive, you're going to sign in. Um, 
and because like if you're doing this virtually that's you probably did most of it or if not all of it when you pre-registered for to get the zoom link um if you are going in person there'll be a check-in sheet that has the list of all the registered democrats in the precinct uh on it and you will sign in next to your name um now what happens if you're not on that check-in sheet um you know if you are absolutely sure that you're in the right precinct right and that you are a registered democrat you can sign an affidavit uh and participate and i'm i'm assuming they will have virtual affidavits as well but uh it is an important thing to note uh, that if someone in your precinct has signed in with an affidavit instead of on the sign-in sheet, um, if they later become a delegate to county uh, and it's fi and you, you figure out, the county Dems figure out, no, actually they're an unaffiliated, or no, nope, they were in the wrong precinct, or whatever the case might be, they will be unseated and that your precinct will lose a delegate, will essentially lose power. Uh, in the county processes ahead so i uh, just word to the wise i uh, just you know just know uh that those who are on an affidavit run the risk of um being disqualified as delegates all right now after you've checked in if you are in person in particular look for volunteers or staff from the candidates you're supporting. If you're there to support candidate X who's running for the state house in your area, right, you probably want to go find the, you know, folks who have who are handing out stickers for that candidate and tell them, hey, I'm here and I'm supporting your guy. Like, <laughs> that is helpful to the campaign. Um, so let them know that you're caucusing for their candidate. Um, and they might just have some fun buttons or stickers or what have you for you. Um and at minimum, they might have a piece of lit for you that you can carry into your your precinct caucus and say, this is why I love this guy. <laughs> this why why I love Candidate X. So, uh, so just know that that's, uh, you should, that's a piece of stuff you should do as well. Frankly, they may also catch you on the way into caucus. That's fine. Just make sure you're not late signing in that, on that sign-in sheet. All right, so once all the sign-in hoopla has happened, there will be uh, something that happens in the big room. Typically, this is in a cafeteria or auditorium or something like that. Um, caucus will be, quote-unquote, gaveled in. It will be called to order um, at the start time. Um, there will be a reading of the rules. Either you will be told, hey, all the rules of caucus are on the pieces of paper that are scattered all over the gym. Or they somebody may read them out loud. Uh, aloud. It depends on your county. Either way, I I pray that you are not in one of the counties where they read the rules out loud because it is long and tedious and boring. Um, but <laughs> if you are, then uh, just bear with it, uh, and you may actually learn a thing or two. Um, then after that, candidates or their surrogates typically get a chance to speak, um, and uh. After that, after all of that sort of hoopla and formality, um, you will then get into the meat of what caucus actually is, which is breaking into your small groups by precinct. So in your precinct, uh, the first thing you will do is elect a chair and a secretary in each precinct. They can be the same person. Generally speaking, it's good if it's two people. Um, they will like run the agenda, they'll count votes, they'll fill out and submit the official forms. And honestly, these roles are not like, I know that it's, you know, being chair and secretary of your caucus seems like very official. There are like written instructions in every caucus packet. Um, and so every precinct's little packet of stuff. Um, and seriously, anyone can do this. Um, it is really okay. If you want to take notes, and turn in the official forms, you can be the secretary. It is just fine. <laughs> um, often the, you know, the chair, uh, the chair in particular is often the precinct, one of the precinct organizers for the precinct, if you have one. Um, you know, in my precinct, it is usually me. <laughs> so, um, but it certainly doesn't have to be. And not every precinct has a precinct organizer. So uh, if you find yourself sitting with three other people and none of you have done this before, it's okay. There are instructions in the packet. Just follow them. <laughs> um, and 
uh, the uh, the next thing you will do is to elect precinct organizers. Um, as I was saying earlier, precinct organizers are like the formal like party officers in your neighborhood. Basically, they they serve a two year term. They serve as a member of the central committee uh, of the county Democratic Party, um, and the main job of precinct organizers is to get their neighbors out to vote, um, to get their Democratic and progressive unaffiliated neighbors out to vote, particularly in general elections, but also in like city council elections and all that good stuff. So um, now you may end up with in, in a place where the precinct organizer couldn't make it to caucus that night because they were away on a work trip or family stuff or whatever. Um, they also... Uh, you may also see a letter in your packet uh, from somebody who wants to be elected as a precinct organizer. Um, it is, you know, it's called a letter of intent. Uh, that should be read out loud. It's pretty rare. Most precinct organizers show up and run their caucus. But if you happen to be in a precinct that has a letter from somebody saying, hey, I'm the precinct organizer and I couldn't make it tonight. Or, hey, I want to be a precinct organizer but couldn't make it tonight. Um, they can be considered for that position just fine. So, though it's up to the people at the caucus whether to elect them. Just FYI. Um, the next thing is you'll do go through a straw poll on the region at large, and that's just an informal show of hands. So the caucus chair should say something along the lines of, "All right, we're going to do the straw poll. This is non-binding." on where people are at on the region at large race. Here are the candidates who are going through the caucus process. Um, and there are, uh, the, I'll get into who the candidates are momentarily, but I believe there's two candidates, maybe three, going through the caucus and assembly process uh, for seat region at large. Now, the other important thing here is that uncommitted is an acceptable group, but all of these candidates and uncommitted in order to be viable uh, which is to say in order to be eligible to win delegates they have to get at least 15 percent so if you're the only one and only person holding your hand up in the straw poll for a candidate or for uncommitted you're probably not going to get elected as a delegate uh, if you're not crossed because you're probably not crossing that 15 percent viability threshold now if there are four of you who show up to caucus and you get four delegates in your precinct, congratulations, you can all be delegates to <laughs> no matter what, and it's all viable because that's 25%. So it really just depends on how many folks show up in your precinct. But just know that that 15% is the magic number uh, that makes a group in caucus viable. Um, now, at this point, you can also request that a straw poll be held for any other contested race. So let's say there's a contested state Senate race in your area. You can say, okay, cool. That's cool about region at large. But what I really, what I really want to know is who you support in our state Senate race. And I want to see a show of hands on that. And then you can see that, see where folks in the room are on the state Senate race, right? It just, you know, and you can do that for any contested race in your area. Uh, because that's important, right? It's important to know if you're electing delegates, if they're actually going to be representing your interests going forward. All right. These are the region at-large candidates that are filed. Um, they're both viable. Uh, Charles Johnson CJ got in a little bit later than, than Elliot did, Elliot Hood did. But, you know... As you can see, they're both raising a decent amount of money. They both seem to be doing their thing. Um, you know, don't know. I don't know a ton about either of them. I'm not here to to evangelize for one or the other. WFP has not made an endorsement in this race. Um, so use your best judgment in terms of um, which one of these you are most interested in supporting. Or if you're just like, you know what? I don't know. I think uncommitted is probably going to be the biggest group in our caucus. That may actually be the case. So, um, and then so after the straw polls, right? Um, there folks in the caucus. Let's say somebody is really passionate about CJ or really passionate about Elliot, right? If they, if people want to talk about why they're supporting either one, right? Folks should be granted time to do that. 
right? This is, like, where the meat of caucus happens. It's like, you do the straw poll, and then, like, y'all talk as neighbors and go, which one do we think is best for, like, our community, right? Um, and you try to persuade each other, and that's cool. Um, and then, you know, because there is room for that persuasion deliberately in caucus, you can, if you decide, you know what, like, I really like what, you know, CJ was putting down, but I really like what this, you know, what my neighbor had to say about Hood. I'm going to move over to that camp. You can totally do that. That is no harm, no foul, right? So after that discussion happens, then is when comes the official preference poll. And that is only taken uh, for the region at large race. Yep. Um, and the, you know, that is when the votes actually get recorded. And just remember, it's a 15% threshold for viability. 15% of the people in that, in your precinct, have to uh, be supportive of a thing for it to earn a, of a candidate or, or uncommitted for it to get a delegate. So, after that, the chair and secretary will fill out what's called the math worksheet. Don't worry, it's not that intimidating. It is what it is. <laughs> and figure out how many delegates go to each regent candidate, etc. Um, and then your caucus will divide into preference groups um, by regent candidate, also uncommitted, right? Let's say everyone at your caucus decides, you know... Well, let's say you've got, you figure out that you're getting one, de like, one delegate for Hood, one delegate for CJ, one delegate for Uncommitted, right? That that's how your caucus broke out. Well, then whoever was Uncommitted will go into a, one corner of the room. Whoever was for CJ will go into one corner of the room. And whoever goes for Hood was will be in the other corner of the room. And each of you will figure out amongst yourselves and those preference groups who you want your delegate to be, who moves on to county. Now, a note for elected officials. There are no longer any automatic delegates to higher levels of the process. So if you happen to have a council member, state senator, or what have you in you, in the room with you, uh, who happens to be in your precinct, um, and they go, well, I don't have to run because I'm an automatic delegate. Depending on whether you like them or not, you can tell them there are no automatic delegates anymore. <laughs> you are living in the past, sir. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah. The other thing is you should try to maintain gender balance in your delegate select uh, delegate election process. That is, uh, that is not it, like it's not mandatory, but it is helpful, right? Um, that you do that as much as you can, um, and then. I will just tell you that, you know, you should elect people as delegate who are actually able to attend county assembly as a rule, though there are at least a couple of counties that are allowing proxies Denver among them. So if, you know, God forbid something happens or the babysitter cancels or whatever, you could submit a proxy um, in Denver County. I'm not, but not all counties allow proxies. So in many counties, if you, uh, if you as a delegate cannot attend, your precinct just loses that vote. So. All right. Um, those preference groups, right? Now, when you are sitting in your preference group for Hood or CJ or Uncommitted, you can choose to do, do a straw poll then, too. Basically, you can choose to just do a straw poll at different phases of this process to see kind of where people are at. Um you know, in other contested elections in your area, right? But absolutely you should do it before you elect delegates, right? Because, for example, if I'm in House District 8, WFP has not endorsed in House District 8. Frankly, I'm not even 100% certain who I'm voting for. Don't tell any of the candidates that, yet that, because then I will hear from all four of them <laughs> again. <laughs> but uh, it's, we got a... a four-way race at HD8 for uh, Leslie Harrod's seat, which is, she's vacating, she's termed out. And at the end of the day, um, you know, how people are voting on that race might matter to me. So when I'm in my little preference group for probably uncommitted on CU Regent, um, I'm going to ask anybody else in it, what are you going to do on the House District race? <laughs> 
And who knows? They might, everybody might be uncommitted on that one. Or, you know, I might have somebody who loves Quan Atlas or loves Sean Pettyford or loves, you know, Victor Ben Como or Lindsay Gilchrist. I don't know. You know, so we'll find out. Uh, I will find out at caucus. Uh, and uh, and that is what it is. But you can ask. The point is, I if nobody else does, I'll probably ask for a straw poll at that point just to figure out where people are at in the House district. Okay. Now, this is another place where you could have, uh, you know, somebody who is unable to attend caucus uh, submit a letter saying they want to run for delegate. But just FYI, they are not considered present. They don't get to vote on anything else. Um, and it is absolutely up to all of you who did show up that night whether to accept them as a delegate candidate or not. So you can decide amongst yourselves... Well, this person couldn't even make it to caucus. How, how am I sure they're going to make it to assembly? Or you can go, okay, fine. You're, you know, you're in Michigan for work. We get it. Well, fine. We'll put you through as a delegate. Totally up to the folks in the room that night, whether to accept that, that person or not. All right. Finally, after you've done the delegate election, Make sure you fill out the paperwork, whether it's virtual or a paper form. There is stuff you need to fill out if you are a delegate. The number one way I have seen things get messed up at caucus is everybody goes through all the stuff and then nobody turns in the paperwork. Fill out the paperwork. It's not official if it's not written down. <laughs> Some way, somehow. So make sure that you've done that. And by the way, that paperwork will not come from a candidate or other group. It will come out of that caucus packet uh, that the caucus chair and secretary have. Um, if you manage to leave off like a candidate preference, let's say you were supposed to be a delegate for Hood, but it you they all the only thing they got written down was like names and phone numbers and such, um, then you just get seated as uncommitted, which means you can you know be a delegate for whoever you want. So that's fine, ultimately. Um, but you should also, like, and the other big thing I have seen screwed up is if you are in an in-person caucus, please write legibly. It is it is poor old lady volunteers who are reading these forms. Please be nice to them. Please don't scribble your name. It, don't write like a doctor. <laughs> like, you know. And please do not assume that people have your phone number or your email, even if the DCCC emails you five times a day, like they do me. Um, please do not assume that that means that the Denver Democratic Party or the, you know, Larimer Democratic Party has your email address as well. Please write it all down. Please fill it all out. That is how to make sure that you count as a delegate. Last but not least, um, the final bits of like caucus wrap up and stuff, you may like need to vote on resolutions. Uh, to revise the state party platform or that sort of stuff, someone's caucus may bring one. Just as a as a, as a frame of reference, the Colorado Education Association has some great ones that they're recommending to their members, like you know about education. <laughs> um, so just you know that is certainly not obligatory, but uh, and it varies widely by county. Like I had several people from Boulder County tell me we don't do that at our caucus, we do that at our assembly. So you know. Counties are weird sometimes, so if you don't see resolutions, that's fine. Just just know that may be a thing that happens. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the caucus chair will ask for volunteers who want to serve as an election judge, a poll worker, in June and November for the primary and general elections. You certainly don't have to say yes to that. And in fact, if you want to do get out the vote work for a candidate, you probably shouldn't. Um but you certainly can if you want to. This is basically just to help the county clerk out in your area who needs to have Democratic and Republican election judges. And I think they might need some unaffiliated too. I'm not sure. Um, but they need to have election judges um, from from at least both of the major parties um, at every poll site, at every vote center, right? So um, they are just trying to start filling those spots early by doing it through the party caucus processes and asking for volunteers. But again, don't feel obligated. Um, but if it's something that seems cool to you, feel free, right? All right. That was a lot about what happens on caucus night. Any uh, any questions about that before we jump into assemblies and conventions?
I always stumble on filling out the form at the caucus. Is there any kind of quick cheat sheets online that we could see that will show us that? They aren't, there aren't because every county uses a different form. Okay. I would I would honestly ask people in your county. Uh, but the main thing is just, you know, read carefully. Don't rush. Don't let yourself be rushed. Just make sure that it's the right form on the right line and all of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. And don't, and don't leave before you've written stuff down. <laughs> those, those are the two main rules. Um, I have a question about the candidates. I mean, other than the one you referenced a couple of times, and I don't remember his name, um, I don't know anything about the candidates that we're supporting. Yeah, on the on the region at large race, I think a lot of people are going to be in that boat, honestly. Um, and like I said, Working Families Party has not endorsed in that race yet. Uh, we haven't even interviewed in that race yet. And so, alas, I wish I had more guidance for you, but I suspect this is why it's a weird year, right? Uh, because usually it's governor or U.S. senator, which is something that people have a lot more opinion depth of opinion about as opposed to at large CU region um, so I'm guessing that a lot of people are going to go uncommitted frankly mm -hmm. and so we shall see but, but what about the other races you will have to look those up for yourself uh, in your district uh, okay. and figure out I mean I can point you to the working yeah. family social media to see our endorsements and yeah, number, that's what I'll do. Yeah, a number of contested races, but but that's but yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. So uh okay, cool. We've got a couple minutes left, and I promise you this assembly and convention bit is short, and then I will hang on uh for any further questions that y'all have. So once you get to Wendy, you got a question in the chat, which is oh. approximately how long does it take? It really depends how talkative your caucus is and how many people are in it and how many people want to talk. <laughs> so uh, in 2016, which was the last year we did presidential caucuses, that took several hours, I will just tell you, when I lived in Jeffco at the time, and it was hours in no small part because they spent half the night trying to figure out how to not break fire code. Um, since 2016, when the presidential campaigns are not involved, uh, it's been, generally speaking, a lot calmer and a lot smoother, and it usually only takes an hour or two. Two years ago, I was the only person in my precinct, which meant that, you know, as someone who has run caucus before, that was very easy. I just looked at the paperwork, filled it out, and went home. <laughs> so uh so yeah so that's the that's the upshot um and you know it really really depends on turnout and talkativeness but i would i would venture to guess that this one with regent being the top of the ticket race it's probably going to be uh a less attended and smoother caucus uh and therefore shorter caucus so All right, cool. So in terms of uh, nominating assemblies and so, like I stole this from the Arapaho Democrats. It was a beautiful graphic. I plagiarized it shamelessly. I just, you know, stuck it right on here because it's, it's a great visual. So basically their caucus is March 7th in Arapaho. Um, they then move up to county assembly, which they're actually doing two days later on March 9th, which is kind of cool. Um, and then from county assembly, they'll elect delegates up to their House District Assemblies, their Senate District Assemblies, um, their uh, Congressional District Assemblies, and their and to State Assembly. You see all those dates here for Arapahoe County. Now, what will ha you see notes here that, like, for single county districts, like if there is a House District or, you know, for example, the DA race, the Judicial District, is all in one county. So they will take care of those at at county assembly but for any of their house districts or their senate districts for example 
you know, uh, we've endorsed Mike Weissman for a state Senate race out there and uh, Brian Lindstrom for a House district race out there. Those are both in both Arapaho and Adams County. They are on both sides of the line in Aurora. And so those will be going on to multi-county districts, uh, multi-county assemblies, rather. So you, that would be those House District and Senate District assemblies you see out there with that range of dates. Those are multi-county assemblies. So, yeah. All right. So here's a breakdown of, like, some of the places that have contested primaries. You can see that, like, for all the ones contested races in Denver and Boulder and Jeffco and stuff, it is pretty much all handled at the county level. But there is those races, you know, in SD28, the one I was talking about, uh, SD and HD36, those are the ones that are in Aurora that are both on the Adams and Arapahoe side of the line. And Senate District 19, which is uh, Westminster and like Northern Jeffco, uh, Rachel Zenzinger's current seat, that one is both in Adams and Jefferson County. So that's a multi-county as well. Um, all of these are uh, places that have districts that have contested primaries. Uh, and you can kind of see how that all has shaken out here. Uh, last but not least, like if you are going to assembly and convention, if you have a virtual assembly and convention, bless you. Prepare for a lot, like, you know, like, Try not to multitask so you're not missing important votes and instructions. <laughs> um, if you are going in person, prepare for a long day. Bring snacks, meds, a water bottle, anything you need to county assembly. Um, and definitely, like, there are usually tables set up. Like, go check in with the candidates you support. You know, have fun. Do all that stuff. Um, and try to generate, like, visibility and momentum for your candidate. So... You will see that there's both assembly and convention, and this is the breakdown, but the upshot really is that assembly is about all of the state and county level stuff that's happening, all of the Colorado specific stuff, basically, and convention is ultimately about the presidential and electing delegates to the Democratic yeah. National Convention. And so that's the distinction. They happen yeah. at can whoever is not on mute please mute thank you uh if you that's the distinction they happen in the same time at the same place generally speaking what'll happen is like the chair of the county party will go all right we've finished our assembly business now we're gaveling into our convention business right <laughs> so it's rare that somebody is a delegate to one and not the other uh generally speaking folks will be elected as a delegate to assembly and convention um so but yeah, that's the distinction there. Um, now, when you're at county assembly, right, the important thing you need to know is that for any candidate in any race that you care about, whether it's the state house, the state senate, DA, whatever it is, they, that candidate has, if they are going caucus and assembly only, has to get 30% or more of delegate votes in their uh, in their district assembly, or they have to, if they are going to make the ballot, or if they are go, if they are circulating a petition and doing the caucus and assembly process, they have to both submit valid petitions and get ten percent or more of the delegate votes in their, uh, in their district assembly. So whether that's a multi county or at the county, uh, level, um, these are the thresholds for a candidate to make the ballot. Uh, of the Democratic Party primary in Colorado. All right. As you move on in the world, right? Like, you know, you've got CD assembly and convention, same thing. You'll be nominating candidates for, on the, you know, for Congress and Regent, et cetera. On the assembly side, on the convention side, you'll be electing delegates to the Democratic National Convention. You also get to elect a rep to the Electoral College. Uh, about the congressional district and state levels um, and that's pretty cool because when people talk about the electoral college and go like what the hell is that even anyway you can go i know that i, I know that human i i know I, we ele we elected this girl to do that i met her <laughs> i know somebody there <laughs> it's kind of cool state assembly same thing like 
nominate candidates for the statewide races, et cetera, which in this case is just so your region at at large state convention, right? You are just, uh, and state convention is really all about the electoral college, democratic national convention, and you will, at the state convention level will also be an election for members to the democratic national committee. Um, so uh, the folks who not just for the convention, but for two or four years, I forget which, um, will serve, I think it's two, uh, will serve a term governing the National Democratic Party. That's what the Democratic National Committee does. So, yeah. That is the upshot. And now you have reached the end. So, uh, I will open the floor to questions. Does anyone have any? Do y'all really not have questions? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna. You should take that as a compliment. Your Thank presentation you. was well done. Thank you. 